Good morning. Can we have everyone take their seats? We are ready to get started. We got extra chairs that um, have been placed out so that hopefully everyone has a seat. And we are about to begin. Um, I am not your host, but good morning. I just wanted to make sure everyone was awake and, and taking a seat. So good morning. I'm Erica Monet, and I'm going to pass the mic. I wish there was some background music to be played because I'm going to walk off now. <laughs> All right, have a good one. Please give another hand to the North Farmington High School Choir under the direction of Matt Greenberg. Greater Farmington, good morning. And welcome to the State of the Cities 2024. Uh, we have so many people to thank today for this event to continue on in this great city, this great combination of cities and all of our supporters from our surrounding areas. My name is Gerard Allen. I am the CEO for the Chamber of Commerce, and I'm glad to be in front of you today, but I cannot go forward without giving thanks to so many people who made sure that this event happened. Oh, that is working. Pardon me. Uh, so first to Farmington Hills, uh, the city of Farmington, and also our uh, Farmington Public Schools. Uh, we thank you from day one, just adding in your resources uh, to the small team that we have. We are a team of three at the Chamber of Commerce, um, and so we needed your support from day one, providing us with the right resources, the right placement, uh, the right people to make sure that this event was able to happen, and especially to the team here at the Hawk. Um, if you haven't worked with Caroline and Matthew and the team here, uh, they've been phenomenal to make sure that you all were accommodated on every single angle. So we have to thank these four entities. I know, Farm I know the Hawk is part of Farmington Hills, but we definitely thank you all individually for making sure that the State of Cities can happen. So please, a round of applause for these teams. Here. <laughs> a special shout out to our membership uh, without the membership, the Chamber of Commerce is nothing. Uh, so I've seen a lot of familiar faces here. Uh, we've seen a lot of our new members, uh, some of our ongoing members, and some of our sponsors that are also here with us who's, who hold membership. Uh, without you, we're nothing. Uh, but I, I also definitely have to thank my staff. These guys don't get enough help. Uh, we've taken a lot of criticism because we don't have enough women on our team. We're sorry. We're sorry. 
Guys aren't as organized, we know, but we're trying our best. So please give uh, thanks to Chris, who runs our, our events team. You know, we call it a team. It's our events team. And Alex is there as well. He runs our membership team. Alex, you never get to see him, but he's here. Alex is with us today. Uh, and to our table sponsors, who you got a chance to see outside, uh, we want to thank you. We can't recognize, we'll recognize them here. Um, hopefully you had an opportunity to stop by their tables, uh, see all the resources that they're giving us uh, as a city, and then all the things that you can use personally, uh, especially our credit unions who've been helpful. Seniors Helping Seniors have a great initiative for those who have parents at home who need support, our elderly folks in your family who need support, need a little something extra to do, uh, Seniors with Seniors is, is here to help them with that. Uh, and WeatherGuard, and of course, Henry Ford, who has continued to open up their doors to us in many ways, continue to thank you very much. Upcoming, right? So we don't just do the state of the cities. Um, I wanted to leave this up here with just a date, so you go to our website, if you aren't a member, and sign up to be a member of the Chamber of Commerce. But as you look forward for other sponsorship opportunities, these are some of the things that we have coming up. Uh, number one, we want to thank our Women's Plus Committee, uh, who, our Women's Plus Business Committee, who does a phenomenal job of putting together all of our women leaders who are in the Chamber of Commerce. If you haven't been at one of their luncheons during the Christmas time, it's phenomenal. But they also carry this work out during their Health and Wellness Expo, which is coming in May in partnership uh, with the, uh, the Farmer's Market downtown Farmington. Bunkers and bogeys, it's happening in June. Name on purpose. This is not for you if you are like Jack Nicholas, more like Jack Nicholson, right? So this is for you. If you just want to come out, get some fresh air, have an opportunity to rub shoulders with some of your, your, for, your former affiliates here, please make sure that you're there. Uh, our gala is happening in September. It's our opportunity to celebrate, show what folks are doing in our own chamber. Some of our best stuff, we get to celebrate our ambassadors, those folks who are reaching out to you personally and thanking you for being a part of the chamber. I want you to get an opportunity to celebrate them as well. And then our big weekend holidays extends over about a three day period, but the biggest part of it that we all love is the march down Grand River, where we light up the Grand. If you haven't seen it, you haven't been a part of it, it's almost like being at a Hallmark event. The entire city is lit up. Kids are all having a great time. It's the only time they can be out at night running up and down the street. <laughs> so make sure that you and your family are there. It's a wonderful time to see Santa, take pictures with Santa, and we're happy to continue to support that ongoing effort. Uh, what's new with the Chamber? If you haven't had an opportunity to join us, uh, we have more recently started with our ambassadors an educational series that happens in partnership with our Farmington Public Library, in which our ambassadors are actually teaching the excellent parts of their own business. It's not a sales pitch. They're not trying to just make you purchase things from them, but they're providing their expertise in their field. So if you need some more support from a CPA, if you need some law services, they're telling you the things that you need to run your business in that field. So please make sure you join. We've had two successful events, and we have another one coming in March, well, the end of this month. So please make sure you join us. Our social media member tips, this is new, and we found it to be a really strong opportunity to highlight and add visibility to our members who are here. Uh, Dragon, who's a part of our, our board of directors, but also has been a strong partner with the chamber for many years, was one of our first folks that we were able to stop by and for him to provide tips on what things you need to do to prepare your home for painting. What we've seen is that our smaller businesses really really get an opportunity to share what they do great, what they do well, and they get to share it with their community and spread more advertising about the things that are happening right here in our own city. Our ribbon cuttings have also elevated, so we made sure that we brought in professional photography. We've always had, always had great videography with Brian, and we're also making sure that we go live on social media. So for any reason you can't be there physically, you can always be a part of what's happening at the chamber. At the lower level here in the pictures, you see both mayors who are now present at all of our ribbon cuttings. And it adds a special touch to know that when you open a business in Farmington or Farmington Hills, that the leadership is always present every single time. That means a lot to those business owners who sometimes are just trying to navigate 
what it means to open a business in Farmington and Farmington Hills. Who do they contact? Who do they talk to? Who's going to support them? So I have to give us thanks, a special thanks to our mayors who always make it a point to be there, without question. They're ready to speak. They're on the spot. They're talking to folks. They are literally kissing and holding babies, and it's a special thing to see. Because right there at the bottom, we were actually at a birthing center. They were really holding babies. <laughs> literally, right out the, yeah, as soon as it happened. <laughs> What does it happen? They were there. They were there. <laughs> yeah, so thank you. Thank you very much. Um, what we find to be important is choosing our chamber first. Um, and this is a new initiative. We're making sure that the things that we put on in the city of Farmington are supportive of our businesses that are right here in Greater Farmington. So if you have your programs with you, does everybody have your program? If you could look on the back of your program. We're telling you to redeem these special offers for dining only. These are for today. These are our chamber members. And the, the few that I have the addresses on are specific to these address. So please don't just go to any Dunkin' Donuts and tell them that Gerard said you get a discount. There's an address on here. Same for Savvy Sliders. It's a brand new one right on Farmington. But these, these uh, companies at the top made sure that they, wanted to be a, that they could be a part of the state of the cities by providing you special deals. What we want to make sure that we're doing in the chamber is supporting those who are supporting us. So those who are in our membership, we wanted to make sure we highlighted you. So those who are here, I want to thank you. Uh, Farmhouse, Scramblers, Dunkin' Donuts, well, Dunkin' now, Tabuli, Savvy Sliders, and Ground Control, uh, we thank you for also supporting this coffee hour is here as well. Well, thank you very much. And lastly, you are a part of the new state of the cities. What we wanted to make sure we were more community driven. Uh, so you get to see, you already got to see our students from North Farmington. You're going to hear a lot more from our community members here who have our, our college leaders here in OCC. We have our educational leaders for the entire state, for the entire city. So thank you for being here, Dr. Delgado. And of course, our respective mayors from each city are here to speak and our, our large sponsors who have made sure that this could happen. So, with our community-based initiative going forward, we will pass it on to our presenting sponsor from OCC. And this is Dr. Jennifer Byrne. So we want to thank OCC for being a support right here in the city of Farmington Hills. And if you have not had an opportunity to meet Dr. Byrne, I just want to give you a brief overview of who Dr. Byrne is who began her educational career at OCC as a faculty member in the English department at Oakland Ridge, right here at the campus here. She went on to hold research and teaching positions at Oakland University and National Lewis University, as well as administrative roles at Northern Illinois, Harper College and Berkshire Community College. Her work and leadership led to her being named an Aspen Presidential Fellow an opportunity to afforded 40 community professional opportunities across the nation and being tapped for preparation as a transformative community college leader. Dr. Byrne completed her PhD in education from Michigan State University, a master's in English, and also a composition theory from Northeastern University in Boston. Please give a hand to our presenting sponsor for the day from OCC, Dr. Jennifer Byrne. Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure and honor to be here, um, and I appreciate you all. C could we maybe have one more round of applause for the North Farmington High School Choir? You know, this is such an amazing community event, and I just thought if you would indulge me for one second for me to, um, to pan out just a little bit and talk for a second about what community colleges are doing in this community and all over the country. Community colleges are our greatest hope for erasing economic disparity. Community colleges educate in the community, for the community, and allow college access to people who, would, who never believed they would be college students. 
So I want to make sure that we're all supporting community colleges. I think my, some of my colleagues from Schoolcraft may be here. All community colleges are out there doing the work. OCC is very proud of what they're doing and proud of being part of a, a, a national uh, movement to help um, erase disparities and um, lift us all up. So thank you for your support generally of community colleges. And I have some a few words about OCC in particular. Um, I bring you greetings from Chancellor Provenzano, who is out of town and couldn't be here today. Um, he is the chancellor of OCC. I think you all know that we have five campuses um, around Oakland County, and we don't pick favorites. But um, I've been at Orchard Ridge uh, in Farmington Hills since the 90s. Um, my office is there, and I uh, love and adore it. And I uh, know that I've seen many of you in, at our culinary dinners and using our beautiful trails um, as part of your exercise, walking your dogs. And it's a wonderful community resource, um, and we welcome you there. Um, at a time when classroom spaces are um, being repurposed and online is being um, figured out, I want to invite you to see how vibrant our Orchard Ridge campus still is and will remain to be. I have some very exciting news. We have two programs relocating to the Farmington, Farmington Hills campus, um, early childhood education and sign language interpreting. And they will uh, join our paralegal program, which has been at Orchard Ridge for a long time, and all of our other general education um, transfer programs, but it's very exciting to have early childhood and sign language um, joining us at the Orchard Ridge campus. Um, and I also have some other surprises of joining us, but I'm going to wait until I have a visual aid for you in one second. You can read that. <laughs> Your students are our students. <laughs> our students are your students. Um, we feel very connected to the Farmington, Farmington Hill schools and community. Um, we feel connected through dual credit. We feel connected through early college. We feel connected to your students and your students' parents and all of our communities. Um, and thank you for, for so many years of support of OCC. We have a new mascot. It's big news for us. <laughs> um, OCC's graphic design student Haley Martin is leaving her mark on OCC. She illustrated and conceptualized OCC's new mascot, Talon the Owl. Um, Martin of Wa Waterford says she's honored her design is, is selected and really enjoyed going through the process. We had Rudy the Raider for 60 years. And once you're 60, perhaps you retire. And uh, we now have uh, the, uh, the talent, and we um, appreciate you um, keeping your OCC swag <laughs> from the past and indulging in OCC swag that uh, represents the owl in the future. We're very excited, um, and it's rolling out um, in the fall. Yes. Um, so thank you for your support of, of the OWL. We had three finalists, all designed by our students. And the entire community voted on them. And um, Talon was the winner. It's an amazing piece of um, graphic design, yes. So uh, we're really proud of it. So coming to Orchard Ridge in the fall of 2026, we are relocating all of our health programs, every one of them. Um, you may know that currently our health programs are housed in Waterford at our Highland Lakes campus and at Southfield. And we uh, listen to our um, healthcare partners and the educational community who told us that it's much more productive to have all of the healthcare people in one place doing interdisciplinary work the way they do in the hospitals um, that we all uh, visit. So, in 2026, our H building, which for those of you who've been on our campus, used to be the pool, and for many years now has been the, um, the house, the, the home of Oakland Early College, is being gutted and renovated and will be outfitted with state-of-the-art simulation labs and technology and everything you need to everything we need to educate the um, healthcare professionals of the future. We're very excited, and um, our dental clinic, which is a free 
dental resource, which we've had for many, many years, will also be relocating and we will uh, have free dental services for our community. Um, as our students learn how to clean teeth, you get your teeth cleaned for free. So um, it's, it's a good deal for everyone. Anyway, this will open on or before the fall of 2026 and you can watch for the groundbreaking pretty soon. Um, don't worry about Oakland Early College. They have relocated into our campus where they actually always wanted to be. So um, they are integrated in um, with, with our college students, those high school students who are taking early college. So we certainly did not displace them. We put them in a better place. Um, and we're very excited. Here's some pictures of what it's gonna look like. It's gonna look even better than that. Um, but these are our preliminary sketches. Um, and you'll be hearing more about that from myself and um, from others in the, in the months to come. College is expensive. Community colleges are not as expensive as four years. The first two years of a, back, a bachelor's degree at a community college saves you innumerable amounts of money. If you can imagine what our tuition is compared to uh, the first two years at Michigan or Michigan State, Wayne State, Oakland University, all fantastic places where we are e eager to send our students. But the first two years at about $100 a credit at OCC will get you to a bachelor's um, a lot it, it, with, with a, many fewer loans. Um, we have a, a um, several, we have a lot of events um, advertising and helping people be, become informed about how you fill out financial aid forms, how you fill out um, applications, and we want um, people to onboard to OCC as quickly and painlessly as possible, and here's some information um, for that. Our Chancellor Scholarship allows for um, uh, graduating seniors from um, our communities to get their tuition paid for. Um, Eunice Jeffries, who's going to raise her hand, has, um, is our Director of Community and Government Relations, and she has flyers. Please take a flyer from her and uh, give them to yourselves, your children, your neighbors, anybody who may be interested in um, some uh, good scholarship money in the near future. We're putting on Radium, Radium Girls. We understand that North Farmington High School put it on recently and we are uh, following suit and we invite you all to participate with our theater students um, at the Orchard Ridge campus where our biggest and most um, used theater is um, next week and the week after. Um, please join us, it's I think $5 for a ticket maybe 10 on the Friday night, I'm not exactly sure, but uh, we promise it's a good deal um, and you'll have a wonderful time uh, supporting our students, supporting our faculty and supporting the community. I want to recognize um, my colleagues from OCC who are here to um, support Farmington, Farmington Hills, who've always supported them. Um, if they want to just wave their hands, we have Liz Schnell, who's our, direct, who's our Vice Chancellor of Marketing and Communications. We have Christina Ayer, who is our Vice Chancellor of Development. We have our brand new Chief of Police, uh, Rick Leonard. We have our board chair, Pam Jackson, who was at one time a faculty member and now supports us on her board. And we have our librarian from our Auburn Hills campus, but she's a Farmington, Farmington resident and um, official of Farmington, Jonna Balk, who's with us today um, in her dual role. If you could give them a, a round of applause, they've really supported us. <laughs> we will be at the farmer's market. You can look for us. You can look for our culinary folks. Um, they'd be happy to give you free samples and um, talk to you about our culinary programs. Our culinary programs are for people who want to become professional chefs, professional um, pastry chefs. They're also for our community members who just are interested in food and want to have a good time. So please look for our programs, um, not just our credit programs, but our non-credit programs in culinary. We'd love to welcome you on a Tuesday night and have a wonderful time with your friends learning how to make pizza um, or doing a bourbon tasting or many of the other things that we do. Just a reminder, we are governed by a board and that board are your advocates. 
Um, we want to do everything we can to uh, serve the community. If you feel like there are things we could be doing, um, we encourage you to contact me or contact them and um, have your voices heard. Again, I couldn't be more proud to be here with the mayors, with my colleagues um, from, from Farmington, Farmington Hills Schools, um, and with all of you. I want to thank you so much for your support of OCC, and we will continue to support you as you support us. So thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. So I'm Neha Desai. I have the honor of introducing both of our mayors this morning. Um, and I've, I'm here on behalf of Corwell Health, one of the primary sponsors of today's event. Um, I've been with Corwell for over 20 years. And it's a newer system to all of us as far as the name. Right before that, it was Botsford. And we also know our, our campus here in Farmington Hills lovingly as Botsford. But as the Corwell Health, we're the largest health system, one of the largest health systems in Michigan, right, with over 22 hospitals and hundreds of local clinical campuses um, and offices. But locally here, our Farmington Hills campus is a level two trauma center. It's a stroke certified center. We see over 65,000 uh, visits in our ER a year. It's the largest employer in the city of Farmington Hills just by way of uh, showing how much we contribute and what a strong member of the community we are here. I'm also on the, the Chamber of Commerce um, and sit with a lot of you, um, the Chamber members here today. So I just wanted to give a few, a brief introduction of that and I don't have any slides around Corwell on that. But my distinct honor this morning is to introduce uh, the first mayor speaker, Joe LaRussa, who I've actually known for years. Um, Joe is, uh, has been on the city council for, since 2017. He is an, a veteran, an engineer professionally by background and a veteran of the automotive industry. And his strong interests in automotive, technology, and infrastructure, and I'm pretty sure you're gonna hear about that in his speech, um, is what he brings to the table, and newly elected and excited to serve um, our, us and our community. So welcome, Joe. Thank you, Neha. Those of you who've seen me on this stage before know that there's a small ritual that I do when I get up here. So I hope you all are ready to smile or do something wacky. Thank you very much for that. Welcome to all our residents, business owners, visitors, and friends. We're here today to consider the state of our cities. And though the privilege falls to me to speak to such a matter on behalf of the city of Farmington, the credit for the message belongs to the entirety of our community. I'm here to tell you the state of our city is undeniably strong. The city of Farmington is a welcoming community known for the connectedness and engagement of its residents, business owners, and community partners. The quality of its diverse neighborhoods and interactive public spaces, the economic viability of its thriving commercial districts, and sustainable and reliable city services. Our boards and commissions work to make our city a desirable place to live and own a business. I want to acknowledge the DDA Board of Directors that had a meeting this morning. If the board members would raise their hands, they had a meeting right upstairs and had to trundle down here for this uh, show. So thank you for getting up extra early and supporting the city today. Our strong planning processes, connectivity, and constructive engagement give us the opportunity to benefit from public and private partnerships. Our city embodies community resilience with strong fiscal discipline, commitment to public health, arts and culture, and a focus on infrastructure renewal. Farmington holds high standards for its built environment, contributing to a pride of property ownership, a sense of place, and an aesthetic combining history with modern design. The clear evidence of Farmington's strength lies first and foremost in the steady increase in property values within the city. Residential property values have risen an average of 6.6% .6 per year, and projections for 2024 show another increase of 8.1%. Similar trends exist in commercial and industrial property sectors with 2024 property values forecasted to increase 4.7% and 5.7% respectively. 
These positive long-term trends are a result of increased economic development, solid municipal finance and planning processes, and strong collaboration. Permitted work in 2023 representing an estimated 8.4 million in property investment is just one of the underlying economic development factors driving this trend. Farmington's continued AA bond rating from Standard & Poor's, strong economy, and diverse tax base also contribute. Maybe the most telling result of all of this is the faith that others have placed in us with their resources. Because of Farmington's strength and collaborative spirit, the city has received close to $5 million in grants, crowdfunding support, and special project funds to amplify our efforts and help us achieve our goals. I'd like to thank City Manager, city manager David Murphy and City Treasurer Chris Weber for their leadership and support to ensure Farmington attracts these types of opportunities and for being effective and efficient stewards of the community's resources. Other points of strength for Farmington lie in the two departments charged with keeping everybody safe and making sure that everything works. Farmington Public Safety, led by Director Bob Hohannison, continues a strong tradition of community policing and constructive engagement. Programs like Caught Being Safe and Police and Pancakes add to the visibility of our public safety officers and sustain a positive community presence. To ensure the continued success of the public safety department, the city in 2023 invested in updated patrol vehicles, new sidearms, and body cameras that help protect our public safety officers while increasing the responsiveness and productivity of the department and its leadership via the use of streaming video and cloud-based storage. The Department of Public Works led by Superintendent Chuck Udy, also took delivery of a new vehicle, truck number nine. <laughs> it's a term of endearment. You can talk to him after the presentation about what happened to trucks one through eight. <laughs> As you can see, this truck is equipped with substantial upgrades, including an extended snow plow, making the team more efficient in clearing the roads. The team in Public Works does its utmost each day to ensure that all of Farmington's buildings and grounds, water and sewer infrastructure, parks and green spaces, and of course, streets and sidewalks are in their best shape. As they do their work, this team also functions as sort of an infrastructure CSI unit, uncovering long forgotten and typically undocumented things underneath the ground. <laughs> like old wooden water mains, interurban rail tracks, and more. Then they have to figure out how to keep the projects moving despite these discoveries. My hat's off to the team of dedicated pros who keep our city in tip top shape. Farmington residents also did their part to help the city by ensuring we continue to lead in recycling and waste diversion. Nine and a half tons of household hazardous waste and 873 tons of curbside recycled material helped our city achieve more than double the total recycling rate in Michigan. And we did it spending about half of the regional average. These results translate into real environmental impact, reducing the city's overall CO2 emissions by 2,351 metric tons. Thank you to each and every resident and business owner who helped us achieve these impressive results. Well, it wouldn't be 2024 if we didn't talk about elections. Last year, Farmington swore in its new city clerk, <laughs> Megan Bachman, <laughs> who took the torch from Mary Mullison. Megan has hit the ground literally running because of all the election updates that were mandated with the passage of Proposal 2 back in 2022, enshrining voting-related policies in the state constitution. The enabling legislation for these voting policies comprised 42 separate bills, many of which became effective just recently on February 13th of this year two weeks before the primary election. The entire team in the clerk's office, along with a team of skilled poll workers, rose to the occasion, implementing processes and procedures to ensure that Farmington's elections continue to set the standard for voting security, transparency, and professionalism. In an era where elections matter more than ever, I'm grateful and proud of our team in the clerk's office. Just outside the bustle of City Hall, is our Farmington Community Library, a community hub for the two cities. Both FCL locations serve as a central public space, offering resources and experiences that celebrate ideas, inspire creativity, and enrich lives. In 2023, the library signed up 6,396 new card holders. Over half the households in our community have an FCL card, and on average, each household checks out 55 items each year. These items are not just books. 
Community members borrow laptops, Wi-Fi hotspots, lawn games, STEM and play kits for children, movies, e-books, and more. This fiscal year, the library is well on its way to circulating one million items in the community. The physical space provided by the library is just as valuable as the resources inside. Last year, the library was visited over 300,000 times, welcoming community members for English as a second language classes, one-on-one -on -one technology assistance, small business networking, parent workshops, teen lock-ins, and so much more. If you live, work, or go to school in Farmington or Farmington Hills, be sure to take advantage of this rich resource in our community. For all the signs of current strength in our city, I also say to all of you that the future of Farmington is bright and full of opportunity. One of Farmington's signature historic properties, the Governor Warner Mansion, has long been the backdrop for numerous wedding, prom, homecoming, family portraits. The mansion and grounds have historically been hamstringed in their use by various factors and are in need of substantial investment. In 2023, we acquired the Church of Christ Scientist property adjoining the mansion's west grounds. This strategic acquisition now provides the mansion options for future use, and I've called on the city council to pursue that future, taking into account comprehensive feedback we receive from community stakeholders and residents, and considering design options that may improve the use of the mansion, the carriage house, and the grounds. Another key enabler for the future of the mansion is a $1 million appropriation from the state of Michigan, which State Senator Mary Cavanaugh and State Representative Jason Hoskins secured for us and presented to the city last year. These funds, a direct result of constructive engagement with our state legislators, along with the acquisition of the church, will be crucial to executing our future state for the mansion. Thank you to Senator Cavanaugh and Representative Hoskins for your leadership in preserving Farmington and Michigan history and investing in our shared future. City Hall saw an investment of a different sort. Our municipal headquarters was transformed into an art gallery thanks to the work of the Farmington Area Arts Commission. Commissioner Lisa Ferentz spearheaded this initiative and the efforts of Mayor Pro Tem Jana Balk ensured that it became a reality. Thank you to both commission members for making City Hall more vibrant and showcasing so many talented local artists. You're all invited to an upcoming artist reception on March 21st at City Hall, so please mark your calendars and I will see you there. Now I know these next photos may trigger a bit of anxiety for those of you who lived through Farmington's signature project that was finished in 2023. The Farmington Road Streetscape. <laughs> it's great. It's, it's going to be great. The streetscape had been on the shelf for years as an unaffordable wish that left our downtown looking unfinished and lacking cohesion. The combined leadership of the City Council, the Downtown Development Authority, and the administration, coupled by decisions by the residents to implement a capital improvement millage in 2019, helped to finally make this transformational project a reality. While construction is always disruptive in the short term, the long-term positive impacts of investments like the Streetscape Project are undeniable. Farmington Road's new look places a priority on people while accommodating vehicles. And this is a 180 from the prior incarnation of this road as a five-lane county road that prioritized vehicular traffic and accommodated pedestrians. This project spurred additional private investment of almost $10 million with new businesses coming to the city like GLP Financial Advisors and La Pecora Nera and long-standing ones like Jill's Pharmacy investing in a relocation upgrade with more visibility. The streetscape has received critical acclaim from infrastructure professionals, including the Quality of Life Project of the Year from the Detroit Metro branch of the American Public Works Association. We expect more recognition as news spreads about the success of this project. More transformation is on the horizon as we collaborate with the Michigan Economic Development Corporation on a potential redevelopment of the former Castle Dental property on Farmington Road near CVS an additional multi-million dollar project that will bring more reasons to spend time in downtown Farmington. The property was recently sold to local buyers who used to ride their bikes past this location. This demonstrates a full circle of impact from those who grew up in our town to now investing in the place where they grew up. DDA Executive Director Kate Knight is a catalytic leader for these projects in downtown Farmington, and she continuously ensures that Farmington is well positioned for collaboration with Oakland County and MEDC. The city is fortunate to have her leadership at City Hall. Speaking of downtown Farmington, it's booming as usual. 
with its slate of programming and focus on the future with a project pipeline that is the envy of many other communities. The district is an engine for growth that provides a strong sense of pride and solidifies Farmington's spirit of self-determination. Farmington's future is reflected in regional planning discussions as well. The Southeast Michigan Council of Governments, or SEMCOG, recently released its 2050 forecast for the region, broken down by community. Their forecast shows Farmington growing its household base by 2.5% over the next 25 years. I'm happy to report today that Farmington will reach this growth at a substantially faster pace, adding two-thirds of the projected housing units over the next five years. Two key projects are responsible for this positive result. The first was another project in waiting that is closer to reality than it ever has been. The Maxfield Training Center property will become Hillside Towns by Robertson Brothers, bringing 53 new townhomes to the center of Farmington. This project is transformational in many respects, not only adding housing, but serving as the vehicle for a total reconstruction of Thomas Street, with water and utility infrastructure upgrades, as well as walkability improvements. The project is also a springboard for a federally funded community project to add an ADA compliant connection to Shiawassee Park. Constructive engagement with Congresswoman Haley Stevens brought in $2.1 million of federal resources back to Farmington to amplify the work we already had planned. This is a synergy that wouldn't have been identified without active leadership from the council and administration. I want to thank Councilman and former Mayor Steve Schneeman for his personal attention to this project and the substantial time and talent he has invested to move it forward. The second project is the Legion Square redevelopment, which will add another 30 housing units. Planned for the site of the current American Legion building, our building and planning department led by Director Kevin Christensen has been heavily engaged to ensure a solid plan for this site and the new residents and families who I have no doubt are going to love Farmington. Many thanks go to Director Christensen for his leadership, deep knowledge of the city, both of which have had a remarkable impact on the Legion Square and Maxfield Training Center developments. Farmington's future is further enabled by its utility infrastructure. I'm very proud to have been on the ground floor of a key initiative between the two cities to bring an open fiber optic cable network to Farmington. Serving with the Joint Municipal Broadband Task Force and collaborating with Farmington Hills to reach an agreement with Sci-Fi Networks to make this project a reality has been some of the most gratifying work I've ever done. It's also an economic development and growth game changer. The project will increase competition for a utility we all need because no one will use less internet five years from now than they're using today. And none of you is using less internet today than you did five years ago. When elements of competition are present, prices go down and quality goes up. The construction technique that Sci-Fi will use will be minimally invasive, but allow for an almost 100% underground installation, limiting the effects of extreme weather. The network will also benefit from a location near the street as opposed to traditional utility easements at the rear of dense housing rows, enabling faster maintenance and less disturbance from other utility providers that occupy space on the poles. Sci-Fi has already begun construction in Farmington Hills, and we expect them to come to Farmington this year. So keep an eye on the city's social media and website for more information. I also have it on the QT that the pre-reservations for subscriptions to the new service are more and sooner than any other project they've done in the Midwest. So get ready to get on board for competition for internet service in Farmington. Beyond internet infrastructure, Farmington has continued its constructive engagement with DTE Energy to address the frequency and duration of power outages in our city. Over the past three years, we've been meeting regularly with the operations and community outreach teams at DTE. This has resulted in an increase in tree trimming and equipment upgrades to improve the performance of circuits that serve Farmington. I'm pleased to report that on a weighted average basis, the typical DTE customer has seen a 77% reduction in outage frequency and a 67% reduction in outage duration since 2021. While we still have some individual circuits that have not experienced this dramatic of an improvement, I remain confident that our ongoing communication and collaboration with DTE will yield additional positive results for Farmington residents and businesses. Walkability has long been an attractive benefit to living and working in Farmington. This benefit is so integral to the city that we formed a Pathways Committee to focus on it, and they too have been helping Farmington shape its future. 
The committee is participating in a collaborative project with other municipalities to create a pedestrian friendly connection between I-275 and I-75 that runs along Nine Mile Road. Nine Mile cuts across many neighboring communities like Farmington Hills, Novi, Southfield, and Oak Park. Our committee's participation has been integral to shape how this path will cross through Farmington. We wanted not only a way to continue a trek, bike ride, or training run directly east or west through the city, but also an opportunity for those traversing Nine Mile in a more leisurely way to spend time in our downtown. The map you see here shows multiple options for runners, walkers, and bike riders to choose their own adventure and see more of the city if they'd like. When this plan comes to fruition, residents and businesses will benefit from even more multimodal transportation options and an even more walkable city. Before joining the City Council in November, member Kevin Parkins was actively involved in this committee helping us position ourselves to be part of the project. His involvement along with Councilwoman Maria Taylor and Treasurer Chris Weber has helped make this plan stronger and put Farmington in the middle of this walkability conversation, right where we should be. New visitors traveling these pathways on a Saturday will surely take the detour to the center of the city where our award-winning farmer's market will await them with fresh produce, artisanal gifts, and programming each week that promotes health and wellness through good nutrition and an active lifestyle. Our market has been voted the best farmer's market for seven years straight and local fours vote for the best contest. And the market has also celebrated its 30th anniversary last year. 30 years of supporting farmers, 30 years of community, 30 years helping kids learn where food comes from, and 30 years of delight on any given Saturday. The thanks of a grateful city go to Market Master Walt Gajewski and his huge army of volunteers that pull off this weekly miracle. Opening day for the market is May the 4th, and I will see you at the market. You may notice a new element within the Farmer's Market logo that I wanted to emphasize in this address. 2024 is a very special year for our city. Farmington was founded on March 8th, 1824, making this year our bicentennial. For two centuries, the city of Farmington has been a welcoming and thriving community, starting with the grit and resourcefulness of the founding pioneers a full 13 years before Michigan was even a state. Our city has grown to become a model for other communities that aspire to live at the intersection of history and the future. While there are many hallmarks of what we call the Farmington Way, the one that stood out time and time again as we planned the bicentennial celebration was the notion that our community welcomes people from all walks of life. I want to welcome people from all over and encourage them to experience the Farmington Way. You'll feel it when you visit our vibrant downtown, our historic locales like the Civic Theater and the Governor Warner Mansion and our beautiful parks. You'll see it in our neighborhoods, restaurants and businesses. You'll enjoy it at our events and our celebrations, which we're planning to expand with bicentennial elements. Here's a short video that captures the recipe for this very special year.
At this time, I'd like to invite Zach Rich, Constituent Services Director for Congresswoman Haley Stevens and Secretary of the Farmington Public Schools Board of Education, and Jackie Thomason, District Director for State Senator Mary Cavanaugh, to the stage for a special presentation. Thank you, Mayor. On behalf of Congresswoman Haley Stevens, I wanted to, pre to present with you this proclamation, uh, just celebrating the city of Farmington on its bicentennial. Uh, while the Congresswoman has recently added Farmington Hills to her district, uh, this past year she has been representing the city of Farmington since coming into office in 2019. And so this means a lot uh, to her to be able to celebrate this with you. And it's a point of personal pride as a representative of this community and one who, when you're talking about the farmer's market, that's how I start out off every Saturday that I can. So, Mr. Mayor, congratulations on 200 years. We look forward to our continued partnership for many years to come. The state legislators couldn't be here today due to their obligations in Lansing, but I know they wish they could be here to celebrate with all of you. And I have um, brought this tribute in celebration of the bicentennial, so congratulations to you in the city of Barnington. Thank you very much. I feel like I should like thrust these in the air and like, you know, it's not the Stanley Cup. Yeah, it's not the Stanley Cup. Thank you, Zach and Jackie, and thank you to the Congresswomen and our state legislators uh, for their support of the Bicentennial. As with anything as big as a 200-year-old birthday, it takes a team. I want to thank Bicentennial Steering Committee Chair Sean Murphy and Councilwoman Maria Taylor for their commitment and energy to ensure that our celebration is worthy of a 200-year track record. Be sure to join us on the anniversary of the founding on March 8th for a special release of the 1824 Farmhouse Ale, a bicentennial brew custom made by the Farmington Brewing Company and a pub crawl that will surely follow on Friday, starting at five o'clock. I hope to see you all out and about. And this brew is uh, custom made for celebrating 200 years of a welcoming community. Farmington is a peerless city with solid leadership, committed citizens that constantly show their love for our community through service. We're blessed with the strength and support of our families and friends, and I'd like to take this moment to thank my council colleagues and their families for their service to the city. I'd also like to thank my wife, Missy, my children, Sophia and Mateo, and my parents, Helene and Joe, for all they've done and continue to do to allow me the privilege to serve the city that I love very much. The state of our city is strong. Farmington's future is strong. I look forward to seeing that future come to be and doing what it takes to see that it happens. Thank you for your attention and may God continue to bless Farmington. be honest, I hate public speaking. <laughs> um, good morning, everybody. My name is Jaden Thomas. Um, I am the senior class president at North Farmington High School. Uh, I have been able to be the class president for the class of 2024 for the last two years and has served on the board for the last four years. So um, yes, thank you for having me today. As a senior class president of North Farmington High School, I am honored to extend a warm welcome to you to the Chamber of Commerce State of the Cities event. It is with great enthusiasm and dedication that I share my vision for leaving a remarkable legacy at our esteemed intuition. At North Farmington High School, we are committed to fostering a community of excellence, innovation, and inclusivity. As senior class president, I've had the privilege 
of working alongside our talented students, faculty, and administration to create positive change and enduring memories for our school. Although we as a community have endured some tough times going through COVID, together we have managed to reestablish a common ground and navigate through trials and tribulations. One of my utmost aspirations is to leave a legacy that embodies the values and aspirations of our student body. I believe that by installing a culture of philanthropy, creativity, and leadership, we can positively impact the lives of the future generations of students at North Farmington High School and Farmington Public Schools. Through various initiatives and projects, we aim to enhance academic opportunities, promote diversity and inclusion, and foster a sense of belonging among all students, whether it's through fundraising efforts to support school events, organizing community service projects, or implementing innovative programs. Our goal is to leave an inedible mark on the fabric of our school's history. As we strive to uphold the rich traditions and spirits of North Farmington High School and Farmington Public Schools, I am confident that with the support of our community and distinguished guests like yourself, we will continue to inspire and empower the leaders of tomorrow. Thank you for your time, and once again, welcome to the Chamber of Commerce, State of the Cities. At this time, I would like to welcome up Dr. Christopher Delgado, who serves as the Superintendent of Farmington Public Schools. After graduating from Michigan State University, he began his career as a high school and middle school Spanish teacher in Colorado Springs, Colorado. Six years later, he returned to Michigan as a high school Spanish teacher in Birmingham, Michigan, followed by 18 years in administration, including roles as high school associate principal, middle school principal, and deputy superintendent. He completed his master's of educational administration from Michigan State University, go green, <laughs> and his educational specialist and doctorate from Oakland University. Since Dr. Delgado has taken office, he has been a great support to the students and staff. I've had the pleasure of working with him during my time at North Farmington High School. At this time, would you please help me welcome our wonderful superintendent of Farmington Public Schools, Dr. Christopher Delgado. How about a round of applause for Jaden again? have the clicker? Jane, did you take the clicker? I did not. Okay. <laughs> okay, here we go. Thank you. Well, the, you know, these, these kids, I learn a lot from the kids, and they have their speeches on their phones, so, uh, but I can't replicate that. I'd need my readers, so. <laughs> well, uh, good morning and welcome. I am Christopher Delgado. I am your proud superintendent of your Farmington Public Schools. Before I begin, I'd like to introduce some of our board members who are able to be here, and they dedicate their time and commitment in a volunteer basis for the benefits of all of the students and families in our community. Um, we have over to my right, we have Dr. Blau, our, Dr. Cheryl Blau, our president of our Board of Education. We have Miss Terry Weems, our treasurer of our Board of Education. To my left, we have Miss Angie Smith, trustee of our Board of Education. And you did see Zach Rich. Okay, Zach's in the back, back our secretary of our Board of Education as well. The state of your school district is strong. The state of your school district is stable. And as you can see from the wonderful students, your students in your school district are absolutely thriving. Okay. Maybe I can just, we'll go back to the, I'll tap and you can click for me. 
you can go. So, uh, well, this is one of my favorite pictures. This is at our Farmington Early Childhood Center with my, my young friend, my cabinet and I, who I have members of my cabinet in the audience as well. We do instructional walkthroughs to every single school. We go to every single classroom and meet our students and support our wonderful teachers. And this little guy wanted me to take a few minutes to play dinosaurs with him in our <laughs> Early Childhood Center. Okay. In Farmington Public Schools, there are three main areas that we focus on. Of course, our job is achievement. It's student achievement. But it's also innovation. As we think about the future in the world that our students will be inheriting, the need to innovate and to um, be creative and be curious is critically important. But none of those happen without the last item there, which is belonging. And that's where I'd like to start with you this morning. Go next. For the past four years, we've worked diligently to create a brand new mission for our school district, a brand new vision for our school district, and a profile of a lifelong learner. And I'd like to unpack this a little bit to show you that this is an intentional effort for students to feel that they are a part of the school district, that they belong in the school district, that they're supported in this school district. Our profile is our promise to our students and to our community. We believe that if you go through Farmington Public Schools through a K-12 experience, that we're going to help instill the characteristics of our profile to make a well-rounded, wonderful citizen and a thriving young adult. It starts with our mission. And it starts with safety that you can see that I emphasize. Our job is to provide a physically and intellectually and socially safe environment. And when I say we, it's all of the members of our school community, which includes our wonderful teachers, our paraprofessionals, our secretaries, our custodians, our bus drivers, and you as parents and community members. We, we can go back, yep. They need to be safe so they can look at this cycle of learning. And the cycle begins with investigation and curiosity, which leads to growth and expression. And we want to teach our students how to properly express themselves in a variety of ways. And of course, reflection. It's something that we as adults don't often do very much, but we want to institutionalize reflection in their daily work so they can innovate and they can move forward. For any of us who know a design cycle, whether it's in engineering or any other aspect, the whole idea of a design cycle is something that systemically we're trying to create in our young people and in all of our classrooms every day. The vision talks about celebrating the diversity of our community. We have a deep and long-standing commitment to our diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts in our school district. We have the beautiful opportunity of living in this incredibly diverse community. So together with our diverse community, we want to look to provide equitable experience for every single student in our school district. And it's very important, we, th we thought about these words wisely, to think about helping students develop their passions and their interests through our schools. So it's not the old model of we will offer you a certain uh, curriculum, we will offer you certain courses for you to then follow a set path. We want sincerely for our students to have voice and choice in their learning to develop and pursue their passions, their interests to prepare for their future. That's the vision. And it's us as adults who provide those classes, those courses, those experiences that you'll hear a little bit more about to help our young people develop their interests and passions to materialize into their future. So the profile of the learner has several components. And I'm, I'm, I'm not going to read these to you, but I'll walk through these. We start with thinking about creating compassionate community members. And a compassionate community member really identifies and appreciates the uniqueness of each individual, inherently believes that every single person has something to contribute in this world, in their classroom, in their school. And as you can see from Jaden and the other young people, they're contributing in many different ways, whether it's through artistic endeavors or academic endeavors or leadership like Jaden. So the idea of being a compassionate community member starts with the premise that every single person matters and that we're part of a broader community, not just um, uh, about ourselves. In schools, we need to teach our students how to be resilient problem solvers. 
And resilient problem solvers are people who, who can consider multiple perspective, perspectives, who can learn to struggle. And that's something that uh, we've seen change over the years in public education is, is um, the lessening, if you will, of students being able to struggle and have that resiliency. So we're, we're, double down, we're doubling down on that to come back to allowing our students to fail in a safe environment so they learn through that failure so they can be problem solvers, they, they can look at different solutions and they can navigate that journey. Indeed, any of us who've gone through challenges know that we're better on the other side of that. And so we're trying to in institutionalize the resiliency of our young people. Becoming a self-actualizer is really, really critical. And if we look at the bottom, it talks about students identifying what their strong uh, strengths are, their talents, and then being gracious and gentle with themselves, being self-compassion, self-compassionate and self-aware and accepting themselves because they're ultimately in control of their own future. And so helping students to realize what they're good at, what they enjoy, having a growth mindset, always believing that they can learn more, they can be more, they can become more, that's being a self-actualizer. And so we're embedding this into the profile of our lifelong learner. Of course, it's critically important to communicate in various formats. And so we want our young people to use a variety of methods to express their ideas effectively. And incredibly important to understand how to have civil discourse. As adults, we should be modeling that. We don't always do the best job of that, and our young people are watching. And so we're trying to replicate experiences where they can debate, they can have conversation, they can communicate, they can express themselves in an articulate manner with evidence, with foundation, and with respect. And so this is intentionally what our teachers are teaching in the activities that they engage their students in, in their lessons. And we also want them to be an empowered collaborator. No longer can we work alone. Uh, indeed, we're interdependent on each other. We are a community. And so when we think of teaching about being an empowered collaborator, we're talking about a productive exchange of ideas in working towards a common goal. Those of us in government know how critically important that is. And again, we don't always set the best example. Uh, and our students see the, not the best examples uh, across our nation. But we in our schools are trying to teach them how to be citizens who respect each other, who consider uh, alternative perspectives, and who can voice um, their perspective as well with confidence. So when we think about that profile of a learner, we strongly believe that if all of those aspects are things that we're trying to instill in our young people through their acquisition of math and science and social studies and ELA and foreign language and all of the other aspects, we think that we'll provide a pretty um, quality young person. And as you can see, we're doing that. And so we are committed deeply to our profile of a lifelong learner. And that helps students belong, that helps them feel that they belong in our school district. Of course, our goal is achievement. So let's talk about achievement for a moment. It all starts, you can go, yep. It all starts when they're little. Literacy is the key to all other, all, all other learning, make no mistake. So I will say it publicly, I am 100% I am in support of universal free preschool for all children. It's something that is a nationwide effort. It's something that is long overdue. As a country, we need to invest in the early childhood literacy and support of our students across our nation for the benefit of our nation. Here in Farmington Public Schools, we have an incredibly um, uh, proficient and attractive Farmington Early Childhood Center. We have 24 classrooms. There's al they're always full. There's always a waiting list of dedicated and experienced educators. You know, if you work in school districts, sometimes you'll see students or teachers who take a preschool job to kind of get a foot in the door and then they, they look to get to an elementary school, not our teachers. We have early childhood specialists who are highly dedicated and trained, many of them who've been at the Early Childhood Center for over 20 years. So they are early childhood educators who are offering programs in Head Start, GSRP, tuition-based programs, as well as our early childhood special education system for our young learners. And so they are very, very proud of their play-based curriculum. They get them ready for elementary school. And it's a wonderful connection to our, our, our school community right here in our backyard. 
Just this year, we were very, very proud to launch what's known in, in some quarters as the Young Fives program. So there's an opportunity in the state of Michigan to have essentially two years of kindergarten if you as a parent see that you have a young person who might need a little bit more transition for so those academic foundational skills, socially, emotionally. And so we uh, expanded this to a handful of our elementary schools. We're looking to continue this expansion to provide this opportunity for our parents. Historically, we had not had a Young Fives program in Farmington Public Schools, so many of our families would have to go outside of our cities to pursue Young Fives programs at bordering school district. So we're, we're happy to be able to bring that back in-house. So everything begins with our little ones and with early childhood literacy. We have an incredibly high priority on literacy and mathematics, especially in our K-8 uh, buildings. So this year uh, and last year, we have had two fundamental changes in our early childhood literacy programs. Starting with our foundational skills block that our Board of Education supported, we had five different schools, teachers pilot this a year ago to see, um, to look, it's a phonics-based um, approach to foundational skills for early childhood literacy that doesn't substitute or replace the, the English language arts um, curriculum, but it supplements it. And so after one year, they saw such tremendous gains, gains in their proficiency that we've expanded it district-wide. So this is our kindergarten through second foundational skills block. And then starting next year, we have what's called Wit and Wisdom. It's another program that finishes up the elementary. So these um, supplemental programs uh, will run uh, in addition to the ELA program, which really have, they're all research-based and they have tremendous gains for our literacy um, support for our K-5 comprehensive model. For, math, uh, for mathematics, we've had incredible investment in math recovery. Again, helping with those foundational skills in kindergarten through eighth grade. Uh, we've increased uh, elementary support and intervention at the elementary and at the middle school, and we're looking at pursuing the secondary model as well. So there is an all-out focus kindergarten through eighth grade for literacy and math support with additional tutors, additional math support, additional interventions, and supplementar supplementary programs that can help our students get on that strong footing before they get into the middle school and higher grades. And we have wonderful high school options, and some of these you may not know about. So obviously we have our two comprehensive high schools, North Farmington and Farmington High School. North Farmington, uh, named as one of the top high schools in the state of Michigan, at uh, having students uh, in this, when we look at kind of this continuation to college, are they not only getting into college, are they completing within their four years? And yes, they are, and so we've been ranked as one of the top schools in Michigan. Farmington High School, recently in US News and World Report, one of the top 100 Michigan high schools, uh, 53, uh, 52nd in the state of Michigan. And so we also have our International Baccalaureate program at Farmington High School, and you can see the wonderful students that, that we've had here as well. But we have two other options for high school. Farmington Central High School is a smaller high school. It uh, offers an opportunity for students to have a smaller learning environment, less than 100 students typically, with uh, a little bit more of a family feel flexibility in their learning model so they can have online classes, some hybrid, a little bit of online in-person as well as an in-person support. We have counseling, we have social work support, and so some students just, um, they're kind of, they're, they're overwhelmed a little bit with the largeness of a traditional high school and so they appreciate this different approach in a smaller environment. And so there are unique needs for student learners and so we're proud to be able to offer Farmington Central High School as an alternative to our traditional high schools. And last night, if you uh, were able to see our board meeting, we had a presentation from our Farmington Online School. So that's another expansion that really, um, when we think about the future of learning um, and the future of, uh, of, of kind of individualization and customization in the world we live in, um, many people want to customize their education. Farmington Online allows that. So we have uh, kindergarten through 12th grade. We have two options, either live streamed with a live teacher or a Farmington Public Schools teacher teaching you, um, or you can do kind of learn at your own pace on your own time, what we in the business call asynchronous. So you can log on uh, and you can watch the lessons as you, as you see. And we have many students who use this. Some of our homeschool families that otherwise were not connected with Farmington Public Schools are now reconnected through our online program, which is wonderful. And then they can avail themselves of all the other activities, clubs and sports, and just have that community connection while they have that homeschool education. 
We also have, um, for competitive athletes, we have athletes that travel all around the country. This is a flexible model that still maintains their connection with Farmington. They don't have to pursue private tutors. And then, of course, we have uh, both temporary and long-term medical needs, whether they're physical medical needs or their mental health challenges that many of our students have. This allows the flexibility for the continuity of their learning while they're dealing with their medical situation. So these kind of flexible models, I think you'll see increasing across the country um, just by the very nature of the different learning modalities for students. And we're proud in Farmington Public Schools to have four of those options for high school alone. Data snapshots. Uh, overall, Farmington Public Schools uh, continues to be at or above the state or county metrics when you look at the MSTEP with the state assessment in, in, in Michigan. The NWA benchmarks is for our elementary and middle school students. We offer this three times a year. This is a nationally normed assessment. And once again, we perform at or above national norms by this assessment. So we are solid. Our scores are solid. They're uh, in comparison to our peer districts and a little bit above some of the state and national norms. Um, no question that we, like many school districts, have uh, growth, and that's on the right side is kind of the improvement. So the improvement and how we move the needle on academics to kind of raise those scores happens in a few different ways. First of all, you have to go back to the direct classroom instruction. And the training that we have, the professional development under the leadership of Dr. Kelly Coffin, who is here, our assistant superintendent of all things instruction, um, our literacy, our new literacy programs, and the instruction that we're having, those professional development and training um, models will help move the needle when we improve the kind of fidelity across our classrooms um, and, and our teaching staff. The other thing, oops, one more. The other thing is we have what we call the multi-tiered system of supports. Some of you have heard MTSS. It's basically a, a, a process in our schools where we identify very early any student needs. And so we meet proactively with families to, to meet them where they're at, whether it's a literacy need, a math need, a social emotional challenge, and we try to do that as early as possible and as frequently as possible to get the interventions to students before the gaps become so large. And so these kind of um, concrete efforts that we're trying to work on really are going to make a difference. The other thing is we have done program evaluation for every single program in our school district. Every math program, every literacy program, every anti-bullying program, every uh, culture building program. So we're doing program evaluation to look at the return on investment and the efficacy of those programs to make sure that we're really using the research-based programs that are going to help move the needle for our students academically as well as support them socially. Okay. And then last but not least, we talk about innovation. Um, I'm excited to hear about all the improvements in our cities. Uh, you know, I'm a proud member of the Chamber of Commerce, and I know that there's really, really exciting conversations about the future for our cities and for our state and indeed for our country. And we want to teach our young people how to innovate as well. So here are some of the partnerships and ideas we have for innovation. We have key future-focused partnerships, very, very intentional uh, focus partnerships. We have. Uh, um, representatives on our cabinet and other teams who are members of national organizations for future thinking, future educational models. We have two very critical ones. We're working with Apple, uh, the Apple organization, and an organization called Urban Learning. And what we're doing is what's called proof of concept work. So you think about a concept that you learn in a class. Well, you can learn a concept, but how do you prove that you understood that concept? How do you apply that concept to a real world application? That proof of concept work is through urban learning with Apple. And we have had an incredible partnership for the last uh, two, three years with urban learning at every single one of our schools and our teachers. We have small cohorts of teachers that are actively working with professional development to transform this instruction into real authentic tasks, real, um, uh, you know, um, on, honestly, you know, world-based situations and problems that they have to apply their learning to. At the middle schools, we're partnering with another organization called New Tech Network to look at project-based learning. And so um, I know in the community, many of you are aware of the STEAM Academy. Um, the project-based learning does not only happen at STEAM Academy. It happens at all four of our middle schools. And we're working with New Tech Network to help students apply their curriculum, their math, their English, their social studies, their science through projects through project-based learning, through application of their skills. So you're not learning skills in isolation, you're actually using it 
to apply to a real world situation. So we're very excited about the innovation of these practices. It's a very different way of learning. It's a different and exciting way of teaching and it takes leadership um, at, the, at, at the district level as well as the building level to bring these partnerships to Farmington Public Schools. Most importantly, it takes support from our Board of Education to help fund these programs. So I want to thank our Board of Education for your progressiveness, your innovative thinking, and your support of all of our efforts to try to bring this to our children in, in our schools. And finally, this year uh, we launched a brand new idea called Reimagining High School. Now I just talked to you about high school. We have four great models. But the future of high school specifically and we look at our partnerships with OCC and some of the wonderful universities around here, the future of high school is going to be very different. It's going to look very different. And so one of the first things that I did when I launched this committee is I went to the students. So I have a monthly meeting with a group of 30 students from our three high schools that is called the Student Roundtable. I went to the students and I said, if you could reimagine high school, what would you say for, your, for the kids that are coming behind you? Especially our seniors had a lot of ideas. But these are some of the ideas that came from our students. And then we expanded these. We met with our department heads, and we're meeting with our counselors, and we're meeting with our staff, and eventually to our parents, to our community. But here are some of the top ideas from our students and from our staff about rethinking how high school could be. You start with the basic bell schedule. There's no reason that high school students need to start at 7.15 in the morning or end at 2.30. So you think about the schedule. You think about the structure. Ironically, what we learned in COVID is that you can have some quality learning online or in a hybrid model or in a couple days in person, couple days online for application. There can be a different way to do high school. And we've been doing high school for 50, 60 years. Um, so experiential learning, we talk about it, but what if we institutionalized it where you're actually going out in the field, you're meeting with scientists, you're applying mathematical skills, you're going to job sites, you're actually working on a project with engineers who have student workers and supporters. So experiential learning is something we're very excited about and making it meaningful and not just a field trip. We're not talking about field trips, we're talking about actual research engagement out in the community. Flexibility of the Michigan Merit Curriculum. OCC is here. We're so blessed to have right in our backyard, you know, our own OCC campus, increasing the amount of students who avail themselves of not only dual enrollment, where they can have a, a college level experience in classes, but down there er, later on the list is the early college options. We have many of our students who participate in early college, and it's such, a, it, it, I don't know why it's a secret, but students can actually get almost an associate's degree paid through early college before they get out and they move on to a, another um, university. So we're trying to increase those opportunities and this came from the students and the teachers themselves. The other thing is work-based partnerships. You know, we've talked at the chamber about partnerships, about internships, externships, job shadowing opportunities. Because we have the connection with the chamber, we have the connection with all of you, we're really excited about the possibilities for our young people. And when I first got here and took the job a few years ago, I met with a group of leaders from the Economic Development Corporation. And I know here at the Hawk, right upstairs, there's the idea of this innovation hub that we're, we've been working on for a while. So the idea of kind of this innovation hub or inventors workshops of helping students understand, hey, I have an idea, how do I uh, take that to, um, to a, a startup company or how do I even begin thinking about that? That's very, very exciting for our young people and particularly for our high school students. So, we are Farmington Public Schools. Again, this is an excellent school district. It's a strong school district. It's a, a, a stable school district with incredible community support in a beautifully diverse um, area. We're continuing to address the needs of all learners. That's every single student. We're continuing to help create through our commitment and the profile of a lifelong learner. Caring, lifelong learners, great citizens, great young people. And most importantly, innovating to meet the demands of the ever-changing world that our students will inherit. Thank you very much and good morning. Good morning.
Good morning again. I think we're almost done. I'm not going to hold it up too much longer, but I do have to give a shout out to Farmington Public Schools. Two kids, I'm the proud mom of two kids who are graduates of North Farmington, both at University of Michigan and engineering and pre-law thriving. So thanks, FPS. Um, again. But that's not why I'm up here. I'm up here, again, on behalf of Coral Health, one of the sponsors of today. And a couple of things I didn't mention before um, that we're going to see right here in our own town, which is we're going to start our sign changes. Our signage will be changing to reflect Coral Health and the presence of Coral Health, as you'll see signs changing from Beaumont um, to Coral, uh, starting in April. So you're going to start to see that everywhere and all of the properties that are associated. And two, at our very hospital in Farmington Hills, we're going to have a new birthing center uh, launching in 2025. So a brand new family birthing center for us. So exciting things. Now I'm here to welcome to the stage and present our very own mayor of Farmington Hills, Madam Ter or Ms. Teresa Ridge. She's a long-term resident, she and her family. And you've met Zach um, and Allie, also obviously with her, a resident of Farmington Hills long-term and newly elected. And part of her vision is to make Farmington Hills a city, a destination city. So we're really looking forward to hear um, a few words from her. So welcome to the stage, Madam Mayor. Well, thank you, Dr. Desai. Good morning, everyone. I will tell you what, I just stood up for the first time in a while and it felt good, so why don't we all just get a little stretch in? Feels good, huh? All right, and down. See, now I've lost him, Gary. Yeah. <laughs> well, good morning. I am Farmington Hills Mayor Teresa Rich, and I am just, after sitting in the audience for these for so many years, just wow. I am so pleased to take part in this important event and to share so many exciting updates from the city of Farmington Hills. I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge my fellow council members, Dr. Randy Bruce and Jackie Bolaway are, are here and Val Nall was here a little earlier. It has been a delight to work with this council. And though the seven of us may and really should have very different worldviews on a lot of different things, what we do have is a shared core mission to do what's best for our residents, for our employees, and our businesses today, as well as positioning Farmington Hills to be successful for the next 50 years and beyond. I'd also like to acknowledge Oakland Community College leadership, starting with Dr. Pam Jackson and the team that was previously recognized by Dr. Byrne. I'm a community college person myself. I, I started at a community college, so I always have just such a fond feeling for the community colleges and the work that you do, so thank you. I'd like to recognize so many electeds that are here today. The Farmington Council members have been acknowledged. Our Farmington School Board members have been acknowledged. And I'll tell you what, uh, this city doesn't run without the excellent work done by our administration, led by city manager Gary Mekshin. City staff, if you could please stand so you can be recognized. And I know today is supposed to be about business, but I'm still a mom. So y'all met my son, Zach, a little while ago, and uh, Dr. Allie Rich is here visiting for um, taking a little bit of her vacation time. She only gets two weeks off between uh, now and the end of the year, and thank you for choosing to spend your morning with us today. I also send regards on behalf of the finest first gentleman Farmington Hills has ever seen, Mr. Brian Rich, who is working today. <laughs> So today, well, tomorrow, will mark 100 days since I was sworn in as mayor of Farmington Hills. And I'm so excited to share what has we've accomplished in that short time. 
For instance, one of the things I promised was we would bring more voices into the conversation. And with this council, we've already approved appointment to boards and commissions of 26 people who had never served the city in a role before. And that brings intentionality to increasing the diversity of our boards and commissions to better reflect our community. And by the way, while most board and commissions are pretty much full up right now, if you are interested in serving, we want you. So uh, hit the city website, fhgov.com, and uh, let us know about your interest. Starting in April, you're going to see even more opportunities to meet with me and some of the council members so that you can share your thoughts and we can share with you what's coming up in the community. I'll be walking the track at the Hawk one Tuesday a month at noon. Those dates will be announced soon. So come on and get your steps in and join me. And uh, we'll be doing coffee hours as well. And hopefully some of the council members will be joining me for those events. So here's the thing, folks. You're going to hear a lot of rah-rah from me. <laughs> Not just this morning. I just look forward to hearing it. And I have no shame in my game on that. My role as mayor is to be the number one cheerleader and the number one diplomat for this city. And I am so honored to be able to do that on a daily basis. So as cheerleader, uh, before going into some of our what's next, please join me as we look back on some of the city's most impressive accomplishments of this last year across infrastructure and public safety, economic development and recreation, all of which contribute to superb quality of life in Farmington Hills. And now it's movie time. Welcome to Farmington Hills, where progress isn't just a word, it's a way of life. Here, dedication, innovation, and passion converge to create a city where most anyone would be proud to call home. From our elected officials, city leadership, and team members, to the countless people who live in and visit our city, Farmington Hills welcomes everyone to play a part in shaping our shared future. Let's explore highlights of 2023 and what's in store for the future together. Farmington Hills celebrated its 50th anniversary last year in spectacular fashion at Founders Sports Park. The celebration included dancing and a fireworks display enjoyed by thousands. The city even unveiled its own commemorative beer, Cheers to 50 Years. It was a night to remember for the whole family. Our leadership, a change in leadership took place in the city last November when Teresa Rich was sworn in as mayor. The city also welcomed new council members John Aldred and Bill Dwyer, and council member Jackie Bolaware was also sworn in for a second term. City operations are managed under the leadership of city manager Gary Mechian and assistant city manager Karen Mondora, the first woman to lead in this position. In Farmington Hills, our people are the heart and soul of our community. We've seen remarkable growth with over 300 new hires and promotions across various departments, including newly appointed city clerk, Carly Lindell. The communications department underwent a restructuring from a majority part-time staff to mostly full-time experts, including three managers, leading communications, marketing, and video services. Public Works also created a pipeline introducing young people to the skilled trades at the My Career Quest event and additional outreach to students. Public safety experienced new recruits and lots of promotions. The fire department welcomed 12 career firefighter paramedics and promoted two senior firefighters to sergeants. And the police department welcomed six new officers, five dispatchers, four cadets, and four new clerks towards strengthening their ability and providing exceptional police services. The two departments also took part in the Polar Plunge. Their efforts helped raise more than a million dollars for Special Olympics Michigan. Overall, the city's proactive approach toward building a stronger, diverse, and talented workforce better positions Farmington Hills to address the evolving needs of community members. 
our progress. Community members can take pride in their city's commitment to excellence and innovation. Multiple departments achieved recognition in their fields, including the Finance Department, which received two industry awards, and City Assessor Matt Dingman achieved a Distinguished Assessment Administration Specialist designation, making him the fourth person in Michigan to receive this honor. Special Services Rock Around the Hawk program earned the Innovative Program Award from the Michigan Recreation and Parks Association. The department also secured significant funding of $120,000 for initiatives at the Hawk and to address invasive species management in city parks. Central Services remains at the forefront of technology security. They have invested in infrastructure improvements like a new employee Wi-Fi network, AV equipment upgrades, and smart signs. The communications department also implemented technology supported by AI to monitor media coverage on TV, radio, on social media, and the internet. For the first time, a paid media strategy with 100.3 WNIC and Jay Towers helped sell out events at the Hawk Theater and garnered record attendance during the city's annual open house. Planning and community development were also busy. They saw an increase in the issuance of new home and building permits with projects like the Edward Rose Senior Living Building and Comerica's regional headquarters. Public Services was also recognized for its construction work on Orchard Lake Road and the Heritage Park Pedestrian Bridge. As part of the department's commitment to resilience and innovation, the citywide fiber optic infrastructure was launched and new technologies were tested toward improving road conditions. Adapting to legislative changes to ensure secure and accessible elections, the clerk's office implemented new initiatives, including early voting, a permanent absentee ballot list, and the establishment of an absent voter counting board. The city's diversity, equity, and inclusion director established a DEI council, setting the stage for integrating DEI initiatives into standard practices across the city. Human Resources will deploy a cutting edge information system, furthering the department's commitment to excellence in personnel management. The fire department's emergency response capabilities were enhanced thanks to three grants that provided funding for equipment, a mobile classroom, and the construction of an emergency operations center. The department also rolled out four new squads to improve emergency care and returned Station 3 to 24-7 operations, resulting in approximately 42 million in property damage prevented. The police department's recognition as the industry gold standard in training underscores its commitment to excellence in law enforcement. Leadership training initiatives also ensure officers are equipped with the skills necessary to serve the community effectively. Our impact. In 2023, Farmington Hills made significant strides, positively impacting community members' quality of life. Special Services experienced a record-breaking year with over 4,500 camp participants, more than 50,000 rounds of golf, and nearly 6,000 tickets sold for the Youth Theater's amazing 20th season. The Finance Department overhauled the city's retirement system, reinstating full benefits for all employees without increasing taxpayer costs. This also stabilized the city's retirement funding, positively affecting benefits packages, and led to full staffing in essential departments like police and fire. Equally important, the city's general fund saw an improvement of over $9 million as of June 30, 2023, contributing to an overall financial improvement of more than $21 million. Planning and community development supported more than 15 families with lower incomes with vital home repairs to enhance their safety and improve their quality of life. The DEI director reinstated the city's Lunch and Learn program to offer valuable educational opportunities to staff on a variety of topics. The Department of Public Works oversaw the distribution of more than 23,000 new trash carts and invested more than $33 million in the city's infrastructure to ensure safe and efficient transportation and delivery of public services. Last year, the fire department reinstated its fall assembly program for nearly 6,000 students and responded to more than 12,000 incidents, a department record. The police department responded to more than 55,000 calls for service 
and collected over 600 pounds of unused prescription drugs. Additionally, through community policing, the department participated in numerous activities and events throughout the city toward building community trust. The Economic Development Director participated in various ribbon cuttings throughout the city, welcoming new businesses and supporting entrepreneurs toward fostering growth and sustainability in Farmington Hills. The Activities Guide produced by the Communications Department in partnership with Special Services was recognized for outstanding community publications by MParks. This award emphasizes that when city departments work together, they can achieve great things for the community. How about our video team, huh? Well, the state of Farmington Hills is strong and the future is bright. As you've seen, we've continually improved our infrastructure. The Sci-Fi Network collaboration is a game changer and it's gonna be a game changer for generations to come, bringing some of the fastest possible connectivity to our residents and businesses. And let's give another shout out to Mayor LaRussa, who truly was on the ground floor of this when it was the germ of an idea. So thank you, Jeff. <laughs> our Department of Public Services has once again proven themselves industry leaders receiving an award for the Farmington Road Rehabilitation Project. And we are dedicated to maintaining our position as one of the safest cities of our size in the state. You know, the number one role of government is to make sure people are safe. And the Farmington Hills Police Department has doubled down on training and technology for our officers, particularly after an independent analysis found the department was already operating above industry standards. And with that, Chief King said, yeah, well, let's do better. And so we're continually looking at how we can serve our community better. We've reinvested in fire services, bringing Station 3 back to full-time operation, as you saw in the video. And we look forward to the re redesign of the fire headquarters this year. The Special Services Department continues to expand its offerings, reaching far beyond the borders of our community and contributing to exceptional quality of life for our community because that's what Farmington Hills community members expect. We have award-winning recreational facilities. How about the event at the Hawk today, huh? And the seeming, honestly, I look at the programming we're providing and it's seemingly endless. From the award-winning Rock Around the Hawk, and if you have littles, you want to bring them to Rock Around the Hawk. We got to go to Capes and Crowns last week. We have everything available for all ages. And if you ever say, well, there's nothing to do in Farmington Hills, go to the website, because my friend, you are wrong. <laughs> I cannot wait to experience the dynamic new development and redevelopment we have happening here. Some recent highlights. The Emerson is a modern apartment and townhouse community. It is going to be unlike anything we've ever had in Farmington Hills, and it's going to break ground later this year. We recently approved the Hunter Square redevelopment project that will transform the gateway of our city and it'll provide outdoor dining, pedestrian-friendly access, and something that's dear to the hearts of many of us on council, public art. We're working hard to make sure we're delivering top-notch services to all while staying within our financial means. And we're listening to the issues our community members are facing and are going to continue to address them. Now, I recognize that we have community members who are hurting. And it's my priority to connect them with resources they need, and in particular, look at the mental wellness resources that are already available here in our city. What are the gaps? 
What is it we, our, our people, our residents, our employees, our businesses need to not just survive their day to day, but to thrive? And we're going to be looking at an overarching mental wellness strategy for the city that will provide co connection with a lot of community stakeholders. And I thank Farmington Public Schools, the city of Farmington, and OCC for immediately raising your hands. And, say, and the Michigan School of Psychology is here today, too, for immediately raising your hands and saying, let's go. So thank you. We also know there continue to be concerns about the damn deer. <laughs> Honestly, I had three of them jump out at me on my way here this morning. So next month, we are hosting a meeting of regional mayors to have a community coordinated approach to what we can do to address this issue safely and humanely. So. What am I, I know, right? Back us up when we make some proposals on this, please. So what am I excited about? This is an exceptional community that's being recognized for its regional impact and its ongoing and growing regional partners. Farmington Hills is a connector of all of Metro Detroit. We're a place where business and leisure converge, and I am so thrilled to be working closely with leaders throughout all of the region to make us better still. On March 19th, get your calendars out, you're gonna wanna mark this. On March 19th, we are going to host a first of its kind collaboration with Visit Detroit bringing their on-the-clock tour right here to the Hawk to give community members an immersive preview of the upcoming NFL draft. And one of these days over a cup of coffee, we'll tell you a little bit of the backstory about how uh, our economic development director darn near tackled the lead for Visit Detroit to make sure that we got this. We are the first city outside of Detroit to sign up for this and to be included. And it gives us an exceptional opportunity to showcase the Hawk, to celebrate the heritage of Harrison High School, which pre, you know, created some NFL players, and showcase our award-winning recreation and performance venue. In April, on the 20th, no, April 4th, excuse me, April 4th, Thursday, April 4th, Oakland County Executive David Coulter is finally gonna take his state of the county address to Farmington Hills. And he will, yep. And Dr. Desai, I was studying you because I'm the MC that night. So we're very excited that he's bringing his address right here at the Hawk. The DIA is working with Oakland Community College to bring more public art to the city. And as Dr. Burns shared, so many big changes at OCC. And I can't wait to get my OCC swag your mascot, that is very cool. We're going to be doing, um, we just approved on Monday, uh, that we're going to be doing some, more, some work uh, looking at our mission, mission and vision and branding. So we may need to talk to some of your design students. That, that she did a wonderful job. National and international businesses remain interested in Farmington Hills. We've got some really cool things that I can't talk about yet, but they're coming. And they recognize the value of our people, of an educated workforce, and our reinvestment in our community. Recently, Chinese EV supplier Jingjin Electric shared that it is expanding its manufacturing oper operations in Farmington Hills. They're investing $16.5 million and creating 100 new high-paying jobs. And of course, I remain grateful as ever for the close collaboration with our counterparts in the city of Farmington, 
Farmington Public Schools, with OCC, and I am so truly excited about the work we are doing to make Farmington Hills a destination city for our current and future residents, businesses, employees, and visitors. And with that, I thank everyone for being here this morning. On your way out, please be sure to stop at the tables and talk to the vendors who sponsored today. And I believe that concludes our event. I'll, I'll turn it back to you, Gerard. Good morning. Was that not a wonderful event, everyone? Huh? Uh, thank you to all of our leadership that's here in the city. Uh, thank you to our school board and everyone's here to help support. Um, I cannot stop and I want to make sure that at some point this did happen. I'm sorry if I missed you earlier. Our board of directors from the Chamber of Commerce and our ambassadors, can you please stand? We have a very small staff, but our board of directors and our ambassadors make sure that all of this is possible. So we thank you very much on behalf of the, the uh, Chamber of Commerce. Again, on the back of your flyers, you do have some specials that you can get to straight down 12 mile that are special for today. Uh, please go to the right address if it's listed. <laughs> please. Um, and I also have to thank before we leave our presenting sponsor for today, OCC. Thank you very much for continuing to support the work that's done here at the chamber and for our contributing sponsor from Corwell. We also thank you very much. And the last person or persons who did not get acknowledgement today is yourselves. Please give it up for yourselves for being here today. Our new format of State of the Cities. Thank you for our production team in the back. And you all have a wonderful day. Thank you.